Hello and welcome to my channel where I'll be telling you all kinds of strange stories ranging from true crime to some much less believable although just as fascinating tales. For today's video we have the gruesome tale of John George Haig, the acid bath murderer. Listen in and see what you think. In February 1949 Police searched John George Haig's warehouse on Leopold Road in West Sussex. They discovered numerous 40 gallon barrels and canisters of pure sulfuric acid inside. Outside, they discovered 28 pounds of melted human body fat, a human foot, human gallstones, and some dentures. What had occurred was obvious to investigators from the acid that was kept within the warehouse. In a truly terrifying realisation, it was clear that Haig had killed someone and dissolved their corpse in acid to conceal his crime. What would eventually emerge was even worse than this idea. It would seem that this was not the first time Haig had killed he had done it before and intended to do it again. He would have kept murdering if it hadn't been for one little blunder. John George Haig did not start off as a murderer. He was born into a wealthy, traditional Yorkshire family, grew up attending classical musical performances and received numerous scholarships during his academic career. His enchanted youth came to an end at the age of 25, when, only months after marrying, he was caught and imprisoned for fraud. His new wife left him when he was in prison, and his conservative family decided they didn't want anything more to do with him. Haig was freed from jail after just two years, and he relocated to London, where he worked as a driver. Despite spending time in prison for fraud, the man had learned nothing and he continued to defraud unsuspecting do-gooders. He would pose as William Adamson, a lawyer. Under this guise, he would sell fake stocks and shares obtained from the estates of his deceased customers at below market prices. He was eventually apprehended after one of his clients noticed he had misspelt his own fake name on a legal document. He was caught and imprisoned again in 1939, this time for four years for fraud. While in jail, Haig recognised that the greatest flaw with what might otherwise have been an excellent plan was that he had left his fraud victims alive in order for them to disclose the crimes. Haig spent the remainder of his time in jail planning how to get rid of any witnesses to the atrocities he fully planned to conduct after his release. He started looking at the French serial killer Georges Alexandre Sarre, whose trademark was dissolving his victims in sulfuric acid. In his spare time, Haig experimented on mice to develop his own technique of dissolving bodies in different kinds of acid. He eventually discovered that it took 30 minutes to dissolve a tiny field mouse and he was able to calculate how much acid and time he would need for a fully grown man. Four years later, after being released from jail and armed with his macabre knowledge, John George Hay got a position in the accounting department of an engineering company. Presumably, his new employer knew nothing of his fraudulent past. Soon after, he bumped into an old acquaintance, William McSwan, for whom he had previously worked as a chauffeur. McSwan informed him about his new business as a landlord, where he collected rent from tenants who lived at his parents' many properties. 
Despite having a good position and, we have to assume, very understanding bosses at the engineering company, Haig was envious of McSwan's apparently luxurious lifestyle and the little amount of work he appeared to put into it. This gave Haig an idea, and it was not a pleasant one. A few months after they reconnected, Haig lured McSwan to an abandoned cellar and struck him over the head with a lead pipe, killing him instantly. Haig placed McSwan's body in a 40-gallon barrel and filled it with strong sulfuric acid, finally able to use his newly discovered disposal technique. McSwan was reduced to a few hundred pounds of sludge two days later, which Haig dumped into a manhole. Riding high on the triumph of this murder, Haig took over McSwan's landlord responsibilities, informing McSwan's family, with whom he had had dinner on a number of occasions since he was friends with their son, that William had fled to escape being conscripted. When the older McSwans, Donald and Amy, grew suspicious because their son had not come home even after conscription was ended, John George Haig murdered them as well. After this, Haig moved into the Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington, London, after being left with the McSwan's money and possessions. The approximately £10,000 he had taken, however, did not last long since he quickly acquired a gambling addiction. Haig was obliged to find another rich couple to murder and steal from when his money ran out faster than he anticipated. This couple was Dr Archibald Henderson and his wife, Rose. After he pretended to be interested in a property they were selling, Rose invited Haig to their apartment to play the piano for their housewarming celebration. While in the apartment, Haig took Archibald Henderson's pistol, intending to use it in his next crime. On the 12th of February 1948, he drove Henderson to his workshop under the guise of demonstrating some new invention. When they arrived, Haig used the stolen pistol to shoot Henderson in the head. He then drew Mrs Henderson to the workshop, saying her husband was unwell, and shot her as well. After disposing of the Henderson's corpses in acid-filled oil drums, he faked a letter with their signatures and sold everything they had for £8,000 except for their car and dog, which he kept. Following the five killings, John George Haig leased a bigger warehouse on Leopold Road to accommodate his drums and acid concoctions. He would murder and disintegrate his last victim here. Olive Durand Deacon was a 69-year-old rich widow who lived at the Onslow Court Hotel, which is where Haig called home. Olive considered herself something of an inventor, and when she learned that Haig worked for an engineering company, she asked if she could speak to him about an idea she had for artificial fingernails. On the 18th of February 1949, Haig lured Olive to the Leopold Road workshop and, once again, shot her in the back of the neck with the 38 caliber Webley pistol he had taken from Archibald Henderson. He then stripped her of her belongings, including a Persian lamb coat, and threw her into the acid bath. Constance Lane, a friend of Olive's, reported her missing two days later. Detectives narrowed down the list of suspects with no problems, since Haig and Mrs Durand Deacon had been seen together and they quickly uncovered Haig's history of theft and fraud, which led them to examine the workshop knowing that he owned it. Police discovered Haig's attaché case, which included a dry cleaner's receipt for Mrs. Durand Deacon's Persian lamb coat, as well as documents relating to the Hendersons and McSwans. Of course, what was left of the corpse found outside the Leopold Road warehouse belonged to Olive Durand Deacon. This warehouse, unlike Haig's prior disposal sites, lacked a floor drain and manhole access. It might have been bigger, but
but that didn't make it better, and Haig didn't think things through at all when searching for it. Instead of doing what had worked for him in the past, Haig had been forced to dump the sludge on a mound of rubble behind the warehouse, where it was readily discovered by investigators since he couldn't pour it discreetly into the sewers. And this was his biggest mistake. Haig was arrested and charged with murder as the dissolving body of Olive Durand Deacon slowly disappeared. At his trial at Lewis Assizes, Haig pled insanity and claimed that drinking the blood of his victims had driven him insane, despite the fact that there was no proof that he had in fact drunk any human blood. He said he had dreams dominated by blood as a young boy. When he was involved in a car accident in March 1944, his dream returned to him. He said, I saw before me a forest of crucifixes, which gradually turned into trees. At first, there appeared to be dew or rain dripping from the branches, but as I approached, I realised it was blood. The whole forest began to writhe, and the trees, dark and erect, to ooze blood. A man went from each tree, catching the blood, and when his cup was full, he approached me. Drink, he said, but I was unable to move. After hearing his insanity argument, one of the arresting policemen told the prosecution that Haig had questioned him about the possibility of getting free from a mental institute rather than a prison. His exact words were, tell me frankly, what are the chances of anybody being released from Broadmoor? When he could get no answer, Haig tried another tactic. He confessed that he had killed Duran Deacon, the McSwans and the Hendersons, which was obvious by that point, but also added that he had killed three other people as well. A young man called Max, a girl from Eastbourne and a woman from Hammersmith. These claims could not be substantiated. Perhaps he thought that if the police were interested in finding more about these other crimes, his trial might be postponed. But Haig's pleas of insanity and his attempts at manipulation went on deaf ears. The prosecution, led by Attorney General Sir Hartley Shawcross KC, made a convincing argument, urging the jury to reject Haig's defence of insanity because he had acted with malice aforethought. The jury took just minutes to convict Haig and sentence him to death. John George Haig the infamous acid bath murderer, was hanged for his crimes on the 10th of August, 1949. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed the content, click the subscribe and like buttons so you can receive more content like this strange story every week. See you next time.